Hi there. Welcome back to Paris for another one of our live discussions with Johannes Vermeerel. Today, we're going to be talking about a new job role that is sweeping across the industry like wildfire. The role of a data scientist is becoming increasingly more relevant at a time where businesses are placing more importance on data and drawing relevant conclusions from it. Five years ago, no supply chain director had any need for data scientists. However, today that's all changed, with the amount of job opportunities for data scientists seemingly growing faster than universities can seem to produce them. So Johannes, what's changed? Why is there suddenly this need for more data scientists? I mean, clearly businesses recognize that um, their data has a lot of value, and as soon as they recognize that their data is very valuable, they need a lot of people to extract the value from the data, and that's what those um, data scientists are about. Um, however, the, the very funny thing is that it's not entirely new, and uh, for those who were around in the 90s, or maybe by the end of the 90s, um, at the time, uh, it, was, uh, it, it went under a different name that was all about data miners, people who were mining things from the data. So basically, um, the data scientist seems to be the data miner version 2 or something. Okay, so if these data miners aren't still around today, I'm guessing the results didn't fare so well. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about that. Um, is there something we can learn from why it went wrong? Yes, I mean, it's, uh, it's very interesting because you can see that um, supply, um, sorry, in, in supply chain circles, uh, data scientists have become very fashionable. So it, it seems to be to me that there is lo something like a, a macro trend or something where things um, uh, wakes and wane, you know, over time. And um, two decades ago, it was about data, mi data mining. And nowadays, it's about data science, but it's, it's a bit the same, the same pattern going on, just a, under a different name. So uh, two decades ago, about data mining, we saw the emergence of hundreds of companies who were actually providing tools for data mining, and most of them did uh, completely disappear. Nowadays, we can see an emergence of um, hundreds of companies who are delivering data science tools, and, um, and also we, it comes with also with data science consultants on top of that. So, so yes, there is, there is something true at the core, but there is clearly also um, a, a fashion cyclical effect about it or something. Okay. It's not every day that you hear the words data science and fashion in the same sentence. Um, but what we're sort of saying here is that data miners used to go by a, a different name. Um, so if that's the case, should we not start selling low-cad technology to universities so that the next generation of data scientists, whatever they're called, so that they're fully trained in the tool and they fully understand how to use it? I mean, that's, that's certainly an angle. And by the way, all the companies who are pushing for data science tools are very aggressively marketing themselves toward uh, universities. And by the way, one of the uh, easiest way nowadays to uh, be marketing-wise very aggressive to universities is to promote open source toolkits because open source um, really fits, I would say, the general mindset of universities. But uh, make no mistakes, it's first and foremost a marketing tool and then uh, or more a marketing approach, which is good in a sense. I mean, it doesn't have to be being good is not incompatible with with, uh, with being efficient and everything. Uh, then it also, but it has some implication for businesses, is that uh, it's not because you successfully promote yourself within universities that uh, you will necessarily get uh, results in your business. I mean, it's not because uh, you become a great mathematician, a great coder, that it will immediately translate into actually creating business value within your supply chains. And, here lies the danger, I believe, and that's also one of the core reasons why low-cad, we are not really using the term data scientist, but, uh, but supply chain scientist, actually. Okay, 
So business first will make sense to a lot of supply chain practitioners because obviously they're exposed to business a lot in their, in their daily work. Maybe the only exception to that is in very large companies where data scientists can get swamped by the sheer volume of data or the complexity of their problems. Um, but is there any catch beyond focusing on a certain particular business problem? I mean, like data scientists will be working on key business problems such as stock hours and reducing lead times and things like that. So is there any catch beyond focusing on the correct business problem? Um, yes, there is, there is actually a simple but very, very big catch. Um, you, uh, a data scientist, is not just about to be able to analyze the, or analyze the business. It's about being able to make a difference and making a difference being, being able to act, to take a decision and getting this decision uh, to pass so that it comes with real business effect in the organization. And that's, that's a very, very tricky thing because too frequently data scientists, they get access to the data, they, get, they can produce analysis, and so far everybody agree with that. But then when it comes to ACT, it challenges the status quo. And it challenges the status quo in many ways, not just the fact that they, they disagree on maybe how much you need to order, you know, do you need to order 100 units or 120. That's a minor disagreement. You can have a disagreement that goes deeper. And there lies, I think, one of the, the biggest potential for failure. It's when um, the data scientist is not in a position to truly act and actually deliver value to the business. So that's, that's probably the main gotcha that I can see. OK, so you mentioned they're sort of going against the status quo. I mean, I can certainly have quite a lot of sympathy with some of the supply chain practitioners because they've been working with methods that have worked for decades. And if you've got someone questioning what has worked and what has been working, um, you can sort of understand why they approach things with a great deal of skepticism. So you mentioned at LOCAD we have supply chain scientists uh, rather than data scientists. Could you possibly tell us a little bit more about them? Like, Why do they go by a different name? Um, I think the, the, the different name reflect a bit our, um, our approach to the problems where the commitment lies not on the fact that it's about data. Our commitment lies on the fact that it's about supply chain. So you see, it's, it's a different angle. Where does your, your commitment lies? And um, the supply chain scientist is someone who should uh, generate real actionable decisions, like how many you need to, you need to order right now. Uh, and so the, the decisions should be um, uh, actionable, practical, and obviously profitable. So it's, it's first and foremost someone who takes ownership in um, the business value of uh, his or her proposition, in numerical proposition. So it's, a, it's really about the ownership. And what does it entail? So it entails quite a lot of things, actually. If you walk backward, so let's, let's walk backward. You know, the, the, the decision is the end game. It's the end result. Uh, but if you, you start backward, it will start with um, the data. And actually, you have enterprise systems. So the, the data, it's about having um, data coming from software. But the data on, only makes sense through the eyes of the people who operate the software. So it's, it's not just software. It's actually software plus people. And uh, the supply chain scientist needs to have a very, very good grasp in that. Otherwise, uh, this person would not even really comprehend the problem that is being solved. And then moving forward, you know, you have, to, you have to make sense of the data, extract it. And then moving forward, you need to build a model, an optimization model of some kind. And here, the, the thing is that it's, it's, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between complexity and precision. Um, real life, uh, the real world, is incredibly complex. And supply chains are just insanely complex. It's a, the, it's a real world out there. So you cannot have like a perfect mathematical modeling. It's not even remotely possible. So you need to approximate, and you need to use things like heuristics, which is just um, a, like a, a fancy name for a recipe that work. Um, and so you, you need to, to do all of that. And these, the supply chain scientist needs to put all of those things together so that at the end of the day, there is real dollars of error that get saved. So it's it, it about not, percent, not percentages of error. 
So that it's the world picture and the commitment to the world picture. That's what a supply chain scientist is about. Okay. But we sort of said there that a supply chain scientist should be responsible for both the software and the people. I mean, what about the IT departments? Should they not be responsible for that? I mean, they're the people who have put the software in place. And a lot of the time, they're the people who build the processes on top of the software. So why are they not responsible? It sounds like quite a lot of responsibility to put on the shoulders of just one supply chain scientist. So are you uh, expecting a miracle from this one person? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, it's quite enormous indeed. Although there is, there is a, again, a, a very big difference. The, I believe the, the core responsibility of the IT is to get the thing running. So it, there is a production that needs to happen at every single second. So the IT is responsible for the ongoing operations. So things need to work every single second. The supply chain scientist has a slightly different responsibility. This person is not responsible for keeping everything you know, up and running. This is, his or her responsibility is about extracting this data and making sense of it. So it, it's a very different thing. I mean, for the, this person doesn't have to cope with all the technicalities that are involved in keeping something up and running and secure. That's IT. That's very, very difficult. It, it, the, the, the commitment is just about making sure that the understanding is right so that the business solution that will emerge from the right understanding is actually going to be profitable as a consequence of, of really pinpointing um, a problem that really needs to be solved by the business and not something like an artifact or, or something that is just an, an incomprehension of, uh, of the data that has been extracted from the system. Because it's, so that's, that's why it, it's, it's very challenging, but it's not inhuman because it's still spreading the responsibility between IT and, uh, and the data scientist uh, or the supply chain scientist as we call them in, in LOCAD. And uh, clearly, Supply chain scientist is not a replacement for a very uh, good IT um, and, I, and very good IT teams. Okay, so we sort of mentioned there the data extraction side of things. So data preparation is a very sort of key thing, but they're not really trained in that, are they, data scientists? I mean, last time I sort of looked at these co uh, university courses and data science boot camps, they're more about programming in languages such as Python and R. I mean, the whole point of a good professional education is it should prepare you for the best challenges in your professional life. So why aren't data scientists prepared for these, these challenges that they're going to face? Um, so it's, uh, it's an excellent question. It comes with so many angles that we try to, to make sense of it. Um, first, uh, universities are good at certain class of things and bad at some other class of things. So let's, let's face a supply chain situation. So making sense of the data first require that you have, you have data in the first place, like real world data. And obviously most large companies who have large supply chain to operate, they don't exactly share their supply chain data with universities. So, that's, so first, universities, they, they, they use as training materials what they have access to. So it's, it's much easier to access open source software than access um, very private, very confidential uh, supply chain data, especially when you know supply chain data get entangled into containing personal data, you know, just like the GDPR thing that is going on in Europe that, that is taking a lot of efforts from, from everyone to comply. So that's, um, that's obviously is, is incidental, but it complicates the situation. So universities, I mean, Yes, you want to train people to the things that are the hardest challenge, the thing where they will be able to, to deliver the, the most value, but it, it's difficult. So it's, it's much easier for universities to fall back on programming languages and, progr and, and statistical frameworks because they are much more accessible. They are more like mathematical things. It's also easier to test students on that, which is obviously as a, as a professor, you need to, 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 to teach but you need also to evaluate your students. So that requires to teach something where evaluation is possible. It's kind of a, cons a weird constraint, but it's, it's certainly a constraint on what you can teach in a university. Now, um, the problem that I see, uh, the main problem that I see with this knowledge about statistical toolkits, I mean, it's a good knowledge. It's, it's good to know how to program and to be good, to be, co to be fluent in statistics. It's certainly something that is going to help. It's not a bad thing, but it comes with a, a, it comes with a, a subtle problem 
is that it can give people overconfidence. It can give them an overconfidence that knowing uh, how to program, knowing statistics, knowing math, knowing these sort of things, that is actually the key into solving the supply chain problems. And, uh, and here, there is some kind of wisdom to, I would say, more, many supply chain practitioners that frequently are very low tech. You know, they, they, they just try to stick to the common sense. They try to stick to the Excel sheets. And there is wisdom in that. It's because they are sticking to what really make business sense. So if you, the only reason why you're sticking to your, I would say, common sense is uh, because you have, you have no knowledge about anything that involves statistics and programming, maybe it's a, it's a bad reason. But uh, on the other, the other way around, if all you know is statistics and programming, that doesn't make you a supply chain expert. And certainly, it's not because you're so capable on those things that it will immediately translate into um, uh, solutions that will generate you know, extra euros or extra dollars. Um, so that's, I believe that's the biggest danger is that we are now producing, I would say, armies of people who um, frequently suffer from overconfidence. Programming is a mean, this is not an end. Okay, nice way to finish. Well, uh, thanks for taking the time to shed a little bit of light on the subject of data scientists and indeed supply chain scientists. That was really interesting. It's definitely a subject that's becoming increasingly relevant given the frightening amount of data that's collected in our daily lives. So thanks for taking the time out today. Thank you, Kiran. So thanks for tuning in for today's episode. We'll be back very soon with another episode. But until then, make sure that you keep on asking your questions and sending us all of your thoughts. So thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you again very soon. Bye for now.